So is healthcare unraveling? Are we in a cosmology episode? In the um, Idealized Design Project of the IHI, we recently did a survey of 42 medical group practices uh, surveying morale among the physicians and the office staff. Overall, only 15% of the respondents rated their work environment as either good or excellent. Medicare and Medicaid managed care roles are falling as we speak. We have tens of millions of uninsured Americans. We have significant medication errors, as you know now, in seven out of every 100 inpatients. Tenfold or more variation in population-based rates of important surgical procedures, 30% overuse of advanced antibiotics, excessive weights throughout the system, 50% or more underuse of effective, inexpensive medications for heart attacks, of immunizations for the elderly, we have declining service scores from patients and, and their families. There are racial gaps in health status that we'll hear more about that remain enormous. And all of this is with per capita expenditures in the U.S., 30 percent higher than the, than the next most expensive nation. Now here I faced in preparing the speech a personal dilemma, a choice. Um, let me explain it to you. As, as many of you in this room know, it's been a very tough year for my family, especially for my wife, Anne who last spring began developing symptoms of a rare and serious autoimmune spinal cord disease. In early March, my wife, who's a tremendous athlete, competed in a 28-kilometer cross-country ski race in Alaska. Two months later, she could not walk across our bedroom. Between April and September, Anne has had six hospitalizations for a total of over 60 inpatient days in three institutions while she gradually experienced deterioration, increasing pain and, and losing the ability to walk. For most of that time, nobody could tell us what was happening exactly or what her prognosis uh, was. Now, I'm thrilled to be able to tell you that we have better news now. Anne has clearly begun to improve. She can walk long distances with a cane. Uh, she went back to work for the first time yesterday, and I think she's going to be okay, uh, although I think it's going to take a long time. The dilemma may be clear to you. The ordeal that we've been through has been very painful, intensely private, and it isn't over yet. And I have uh, hesitation in, in, uh, in using it in a speech. Uh, this year has, has nonetheless been a formative experience for, for Anne and me. It's been the experience of the decade, to say the least. And it simply resonates so thoroughly with the purposes of the Institute and the work we're all engaged in that I, that I just feel not to talk about it or not to learn from it seems wrong too. So I asked Anne for permission to talk about her illness here and she has agreed. I want to first say that this uh, summer and fall has left me more impressed than I have ever been before, ever, than I ever thought I could be, with the goodwill and the kindness and the generosity and the commitment and the dignity of the people who are out there to help us in healthcare, all of them. Day after day, night after night, uh, Anne and our children and I have been thoroughly touched by, by acts of consideration and empathy and technical expertise that these people, and they're all over the system, nurses, doctors, technicians, housekeepers, dietitians, volunteers, aides, have brought to her bedside. Anne recalls a housekeeper who every evening would come into her room and while cleaning simply talk about her children and our children. She remembers a, a young infectious disease fellow who at a time when we were very uh, confused, very dark hour, came into Anne's room, sat down and said what we were feeling, just labeled it. Not knowing, she said, is the worst thing of all. We were fortunate to have these caring people in our lives and we were really fortunate to have access to, to care in several of the finest hospitals in our country. That makes it really hard to tell the other side of the story because put very, very simply, the people work very well, by and large, but the system often doesn't. Every hour of our care reminded me and alerted Anne about the enormous, costly, and painful gaps between what we got in our time of need and what we needed. It has persuaded me more than I ever have felt before about how much we could improve. And I know that if what happened to Anne could happen in the best of our institutions, we need to wonder a lot about what the average must be like. We needed, first, safety, and Anne was unsafe. I've read Lucian Leap's work documenting medication errors, and I've taught about it. I've seen them now firsthand at the sharp end, sitting by Anne's bed for week after week of acute care. The errors weren't rare. The errors were the norm. The neurologist in one admission told us in the morning, he said, by no means should you get any anticholinergic agent. 
and a medication with profound anticholinergic side effects was given that afternoon. An attending neurologist in another admission t uh, called us by phone. He was in Amsterdam. He had decided that a crucial and potentially toxic drug should be begun immediately because of the pace of man's deterioration. I remember he said on the phone, time is of the essence. That was on Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Ann got her first dose 60 hours later, Saturday night at 10 p.m. Nothing I could do, nothing I did, nothing I could think of made any difference. I, I almost uh, went out of my mind. Colace was discontinued by a physician's order on day one in one hospital, and it was nonetheless brought by the nurse every single evening through the following 14-day admission. Ann was supposed to receive five doses of a very toxic chemotherapy agent, and the nurse labeled dose number three as dose number two. For half a day, no one could find a record that dose number two had ever been given, even though I had watched it drip in myself. I can tell you from my personal knowledge that not a day passed, not a single day without a medication error. Most weren't serious, but they all scared us. Uh, when I gave Ann this manuscript to check, she crossed out the word a medication error and wrote in several. We needed consistent, reliable information based on the best science we could have. Instead, what we heard, not always, but often, was a cacophony of contradictory conclusions. Anne received cytoxan, which causes hair loss in white blood count depression. And we asked, when will these happen? When will her hair be lost? The answers varied by a factor of five. Drugs that were tried and, and proven to be futile in one admission were recommended in the next admission as if they were fresh ideas. A spinal tap was done for a crucial test for Lyme disease, but the doctor didn't collect enough fluid to do the test, and the tap had to be repeated the next day. During a crucial phase of diagnosis, one doctor told us to hope that the diagnosis would be of a certain disease because that disease has a benign course. That same evening, six hours later, another doctor came in and told us to hope for the opposite because that same disease, he said, is relentless and sometimes fatal. Complex serial information on blood counts and temperatures and functional status and weight, the information on the basis of which very risky and very expensive decisions were relying, was always collected, almost always, in disorganized narrative formats embedded in nursing notes and daily forms. I am quite sure that the only person who ever drew a graph of Ann's fevers or of her white counts was me. The data were so complex and crossed so many different settings, inpatient, outpatient, one hospital, another, that short of a graph, there was no rational interpretation possible. And as a result, physicians uh, often reached erroneous conclusions about the history, about the past, such as assuming that Anne had improved after she received the specific treatment, when in fact we knew that she improved before she received the treatment. We needed respect for our privacy and our individuality and our time. We often got it, but we often didn't. On at least three occasions, I know, Anne waited alone for over an hour, cold and frightened on a gurney in the waiting area outside an MRI unit in a sub-basement in the middle of the night. Anne's bedtime was 10 p.m., but her sleeping medication was often brought at 8 p.m. to accommodate changes in nursing shifts. By day 30 of hospitalization, Anne knew exactly what sleeping pills would work and which ones wouldn't, and yet it was uh, a, a, almost a daily struggle to get the right ones to her. The new clinicians arrived and they insisted on trying out their own approaches, even though Anne was the expert. One place gave Anne sleeping pills at 3 a.m. and then woke her at 4 a.m. to take her blood pressure, which never varied from normal. An emergency department trip for a spinal tap that should have taken two hours became an 11-hour ordeal of delay. We needed continuity. Anne's story was very complicated. It evolves over many, many weeks. And yet we often felt that the only memories in the system were ours. Times of transition of responsibility, the first of the month, which now I see with dread, were very trying. I remember one first of the month in which the new senior attending physician, the responsible physician, the new responsible physician, walked into Ann's room, cheerfully introduced himself, and asked, so, so how long have you had MS? Ann doesn't have MS. Over and over again, uh, Ann had to tell her story. Longer and longer, of course, as time passed. And by the fifth or the tenth or the fifteenth iteration, the common explanation, fresh minds, two heads are better than one, just gave way to my bewilderment as to whether or not people really were talking to each other. I estimate that 
maybe 50 different doctors and maybe three times as many nurses became quite closely involved with Anne's care in the hospital, intensely involved. And yet, to my knowledge, only three or now four of those doctors um, uh, ever made any effort to follow up Anne's course after she was discharged. Discharge really meant it. Uh, I think the ones that haven't called have no way to know how she's doing and therefore they have no way to know whether their diagnoses and their prognoses were correct at all. The bills were astounding um, and a lot of it was waste. Now, I want to be really clear. Not all of these flaws were present equally in all of the places that took care of Anne. In fact, some were much, much better than others. Uh, for example, although in one hospital, to be frank, patient transport never came, uh, in another, it always came on time, on schedule, and with dignity. In one hospital, the medical record was lost half the time. In another, it was never lost. It was always where it should be. So I have the idea that if we could combine the best in each of the places we were, we would have a system a lot closer to the ideal. But the defects, some defects, existed everywhere. And this, I remind you, is in some of the best places in America. Now, I'm although I may not sound it, deeply, deeply grateful to these people and these institutions. I respect those institutions a lot. But it has underlined for me how much we have left to do. We are doing harm, and we need to stop it. We could be a lot better than we are. And the people know this. It's not just the patients who know it, it's the people who are doing the work. The doctors and the nurses and the technicians and the managers and the pharmacists and all the rest, they know it. They have to know it, the truth. They see it every day. And even if their defensive routines over the years don't any longer permit them to, see what they, to say what they see, they do see it. The errors, the delays, the variation, the not listening, the misinformation, the care environment, not a place of healing. 